Hi, I'm Professor Kit Meshamir from Curtin University in Perth, Western Australia, and I'm the Chief Lead Investigator in Art and Conflict, an ARC linkage project in partnership with the Australian War Memorial and the National Trust New South Wales, also with collaborators from the University of Melbourne, the University of New South Wales and the University of Manchester. And the purpose of the project is to explore the politics of commissioning and producing contemporary art about war and terror. One of the outcomes of this project is a series of symposia which we held last year in 2019. The first was in Sydney in January 2019 at the SH Irving Gallery. The second was in May 2019 held at War Studies King's College London. And the third was a Torrance Art Museum in Torrance, California in Los Angeles which was held in conjunction with their curated exhibition, Generation War. Over the next 10 weeks, we'll be rolling out two videos per week of the 20 videos from those three conferences. And the first four are from War, Art and Visual Culture, Los Angeles on the 17th of August. It was a really interesting point at which to do the symposium in Los Angeles because it was the very last week of an exhibition that was being held at Torrance Art Museum, curated by Max Presnell and Ichiro Iri, called Generation War. Generation War was investigating the idea that we are now one generation after 9-11, meaning that there are a generation of adults now who've never known a world that wasn't post 9-11. So that was an interesting premise for the exhibition. So we worked with Torrance Art Museum to host War Art Visual Culture Los Angeles, the first of these videos is this one, which is a keynote conversation that I had with Sean Gladwell. Sean Gladwell was an Australian official war artist from 2009 till 2011. He went to Afghanistan in 2009 and the Middle East area of operations and produced a body of work during 2010. At that particular time, I interviewed Sean several times of the process and that ended up in a book that uh, was released in 2015 called Double War Sean Gladwell. So at the conference last year in Los Angeles we look back on the 10 years that it's been there since Sean initially went to Afghanistan as an official war artist. I hope you enjoy this video and the other 19 videos that will be on this channel over the next 10 weeks. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for coming back for the, this afternoon's session. Uh, which we're starting off with um, the afternoon keynote, which is with Sean Gladwell, who is this guy with the beard sitting next to me. Um, my name is uh, Kit Mesham, I'm uh, the lead investigator in the Art in Conflict project, which is a three year project uh, looking at the political complexities of contemporary art that deals with war. And one of the reasons I actually got into this as a field of research was that about 10 years ago uh, I went to a party in Sydney at Sean's uh, studio before we moved on to uh, London for a few years and Sean happened to mention to me that he was just about to go to Afghanistan as an official war artist. I since found out that he wasn't supposed to tell me. <laughs> or anyone. But anyway, he, he told me and I, I saw that as a fantastic opportunity. At that time I was doing um, research into, uh, into attack and trauma in the museum space. So um, also, just a bit more background, um, Sean and I were both students around about the same time in Sydney College of the Arts, which was part of the University of Sydney. Uh, in the early 1990s. So over the, the period of the last 30 years, really, now I think about it, um, we've, we've had a very long kind of association where I've written many catalog essays uh, for Sean and we have collaborated on uh, actually producing artworks such as the, um, the semiotex book that we did. Um, yeah, the lith lithographs recently. Um, and uh, it seems, if you, if you go online, if you go on YouTube, you'll find probably about four interviews between Sean and I that have been done over the years. 
Um, and a lot of them have been about Sean's time as an official war artist. So, Sean was sent by the Australian Official War Artist Scheme, which is run by our National um, Australian War Memorial. Uh, it's an interesting scheme because it is funded by the Department of Veteran Affairs and, um, you know, through the museum. And it tends to choose a, a, a kind of a high profile contemporary artist who then gets deployed with the Australian Defence Force uh, for a month in your case in Afghanistan and also the Middle East area of operations um, and then it's it's up to the artists then what they do in terms of the, the work that they make. Some of that work also then gets uh, accessioned into the, the collection of the Australian War Memorial. It's an interesting program because the, the brief that these guys are given is that they simply have to tell the, the story of the Australians, of the Australian troops that are deployed. Uh, and lots of, you know, over the last really about since 2007, um, there have been lots of different types of art that have come out about, uh, about war. Now, I wanted to start off this uh, this keynote you know, in conversation with Sean, just talking about a bit of the background of that, just for people who may not be familiar with how this came about, what you ended up doing, how you responded to the brief, and then I thought we could talk more in the second half then about now looking back, which is now ten years since we were at that party, yeah, well. um, retrospectively uh, looking back and thinking about how that has affected your practice, what you feel about um, the work that you did at the time, you know, thinking about it from the perspective now of 2019. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, fill us in about how, how you came to be an Australian official war artist. Yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of like an, a mysterious process in, in a way, but then I could probably piece a few things together. And I think the, the first thing is that I come from a military family. Like, I, I identify, um, being like a infantry brat, I guess, because like my father was a Vietnam War veteran and my grandfather was uh, involved in World War Two mm -hmm. in Darwin uh, and um, and my great grandfather was um, a POW. So it, in World War One, so I was like, I was the first like male in my family that decided not to go directly into service, into military service. And in fact, I kind of rebelled against my father by going to art school in a way. Not that it was a conscious rebellion, it's just that I, I was choosing a different profession to what my forebears would be automatically lining up for, which was to go into some aspect of um, the Australian Defence Force. And that would have been perfectly honourable. And in fact, I, um, I even thought about it in, in year 10, but I just, I guess by year 12, I was ready to go in a completely different direction. And then by the time we were at that party, I had, I had realized that I wanted to know more about this history that my family had. And also I wanted, I had interest in technology and a lot of concerns around space and landscape. And it kind of fitted to that commission. So um, I kind of found myself there um, later in life, even though I was kind of resisting it as a young man. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, the kind of the, the background, I think. But then um, I think, I don't, I don't know how it happens, but the curators of the War Memorial in, in Canberra, in, in Australia, they, they found out that I was from a military family. Mm -hmm. But then I was also advertising that fact. You know, because I, I, I was already talking to my father about his experiences and um, thinking about work, mm -hmm. thinking about how to try and make work about war, but have, not having had that experience um, was kind of more like receiving information through media. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, so that's kind of what was going on with me in the lead up to 2009. Because you had, I, I remember um, we discussed ideas, you had certain ideas that you had before you actually went to Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about those ideas, but also specifically how then um, the experience of going to Afghanistan as an official war artist changed those ideas. 
Yeah, I think I, I'm going to try and remember what those ideas were. <laughs> but the field strip was uh, definitely one of them. Field strip, which has a reference. Yeah, yeah. I ended up like, in a way like I feel like this idea of the field strip. Like, great that you reminded me of that. Like, Phew. I was really struggling to think of one idea I had before I went because it, it's like because my my world changed I guess after. Yeah. Um, but then um, I, I like the idea that I was I was working with professionals who knew this equipment so intimately and there was all this kind of memory around it and the stuff that I was talking to Max about and the work that we did together many years after was kind of almost like trying to get to that idea that I had before I even went to Afghanistan. Mm. Ended up making the work with, with Max many years later. Mm. So some, some ideas I had, I, I kind of had in my mind and then I didn't end up doing them when I got to Afghanistan because it was completely a completely different environment. Things were happening so fast and I just didn't have a I didn't have a chance to do that idea work on that idea um, or give it the kind of attention or space that it, it that I thought it needed to be successful or, or at least a work. Mm. I don't even know if it was successful. I don't know where that came from. But it, it, it something that looked like it, I'd I'd at least um, process the idea and it needed that that didn't happen for a lot of those concepts before I went over I thought I'd had a, a bag full of concepts that I was just gonna I was just gonna uh, run by this the troops or um, check out how I could you know perform those works or get those works happening and that just wasn't the case it just was completely uh, impossible to try and um, I guess predict what was going to happen over there mm. As, yeah. They, so the, the, the things that, the, I suppose the external forces that you came up against were obviously, you know, practical, technical things, but also, um, you know, the experiences that you had uh, dealing with Australian soldiers in Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think um, the thing that I wasn't kind of working out was, um, or I didn't understand was like, just how difficult it would be to try and um, stay in one spot at, at, and and treat it like a studio, mm. like as, as I think a studio practice is like the chance that you can you can continue continue to work on something with within conditions that uh, favour yourself or that project, and that just didn't happen over there. Mm. I mean, I, I was moving around quite a lot, and then if I wanted to go somewhere, I was saying to Max that the process was that I had to go to, to a my a commanding officer put in a movements orders form, they check out if it was possible and then I'd be able to go to that spot. But then conditions would change as I was going there and then I'd have to get redirected. And so it was it was really tough to try and um, focus on on working on one thing when so much was going on. But but what I didn't understand was that it was also like being totally overwhelmed by the beauty or the scale or the immensity of the landscape. Mm. And maybe the landscape's the wrong word because it's like an art term where we construct an image of space. Yeah. Um, it was more just the the environment. It was just you know ancient and huge and difficult to traverse and um, hostile. You know, it was just it, it was the it was the kind of environment that kind of really uh, impressed me, like or impressed itself on me mm. or imposed itself on me somehow. Um, that was, and that was something I, I just did not calculate at all. I, I, I remember particularly an anecdote that, because um, uh, when you came back then we did uh, several interviews over the next year, which then led to the book that I wrote on your, uh, your work, which was Double War. And one of the things that um, I remember from that, which you mentioned in the book as well, is when you were, uh, you were out on a patrol and you were taking photographs of the landscape and it was a beautiful landscape and yet uh, you got reminded by by the Australian troops not to get too comfortable with sticking your head out the side of the, the bushmaster and taking photos because there was an aspect of, of this landscape that to your non-military eye was not something that you could see. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think that's, that was um, what separated me from pro professional soldiers was that um, I was unaware of the dangers and they were really aware. And then I was freaking out at certain times 
when there wasn't any danger and they were relaxed. So I was kind of out of sync with what the, um, what I think they, they call situational awareness. They, they were just really aware of what was taking place and I was oblivious and, and you know, that was a reverse sometimes. But I, I also had a, an experience where um, I saw the power of the camera um, because the camera is a weapon as well mm. uh, and it can be mistaken as a weapon often you know, at a distance like especially a telephoto lens um, uh, and I was taking photos on a base in Q8 and, um, and it was uh, s security personnel, private security personnel that ran after me and, and I, I just know that when you hear the safeties come off uh, rifles, you know, when you hear the safety, it, it's just horrific. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it was just like, it would have been a terrible misunderstanding because I, I was just taking photographs of an Australian military installation. But they just were, um, were so um, aware that people were trying to get measurements and distances within bases for mortar fire. Mm -hmm. And, um, and in, indirect fire was a huge problem over there. There was always sort of stuff just being randomly lobbed into bases and um, I, I must have just looked like I was doing something that was unusual because, you know, I didn't have a, a kind of a role, I guess. I was kind of floating around sometimes and, yeah, my camera uh, got me into trouble. Mm. Yeah. And your camera also uh, was really the, the instrument through which not only you produced your work but also you then kind of uh, managed to sort of build rapport with uh, with the people who you've been sent there to tell their particular story. Can you tell me a bit about um, how from that came about uh, probably one of the key um, video works, two channel video works. Uh, just, just an aside, uh, Sean at the moment has a mid-career retrospective at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney that opened a couple of weeks ago. And one of the works in that is in fact this work, this two-channel work, which is called Double Field. Um, t tell us how you got from you know this this place of being like this interloper to then kind of making this work with two Australian soldiers. Yeah, well, I, I thought that like you know, the, the, this is weird being on a mic when there's not that many people here. But anyway, yeah. um, um, the, the the idea of this camera being a problem for me. Um, was real, you know, like, it was like, I, I wanted to go around and photograph, but then I was really aware of certain things that shouldn't, were, were making people uncomfortable um, just by me having a camera there. You know, one, one instance is being in a field hospital um, and seeing um, casualties come in. And, and it's quite difficult to um, photograph, um, you know, Medics trying to struggle to keep people alive. It's just a really awkward, awkward thing to do, and um, and so often I felt like I was taking um, the most important images mentally, and they, they weren't being documented. And that was interesting um, for me to think that actually this thing that I've got, this camera that is usually my support system mm -hmm. and my image capturing system, uh, ended up becoming a pro like a real problem for me. Um, and then also I, I realized pretty quickly. And I, I kind of knew this as well from a bit of research beforehand, was that um, like a, a war zone is like a very um, technologically advanced um, field um, uh, in, a, in a lot of ways. It's, 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 um, tech is written into the whole um, history of warfare. So I was talking to soldiers who were better equipped and knew my cameras better than I did, basically. They knew so much about um, uh, electronics and, and um, you know, all, all kinds of, um, you know, optics and whatever. So I just handed my cameras to these two soldiers. It made perfect sense for me to just get out of the way and set up a, a situation or a series of, of exercises and, and see what would happen. And so they were just like experiments, really. Mm. I'm very, very humble. Um, and the one that you're mentioning, the double field viewfinder, <coughs> that was a really basic and uh, simple idea. Mm. And um, and sometimes I would I would I would approach these soldiers and have to explain to them that it, it's just an experiment, that it, it it might not work, it might be awkward, it might be fun. You know, we just 
we'd just all get together and see if it would work. And so one, one idea was that I would grab, uh, grab these two guys who were in the infantry and we went out to the perimeter of this, this base in southern um, uh, Afghanistan in Orizgan province. And it was actually interesting to be in this particular part of the base because it was the site of a uh, drone capture um, sort of area. And these smaller um, observation drones would get caught by this wire. It was quite an interesting process. You know, they're sort of either hand launched or they launch off um, uh, out of fields, but they're quite small, so they, they get kind of caught by this um, this kind of net string system. And so that was all happening whilst these two soldiers were dealing with my video cameras, and I asked them to kind of just mirror each other's movements. So it was really basic. One one guy would start a movement, and then his buddy would try and mirror him uh, as closely as possible. And and pretty soon the, this exercise started getting a bit more tense because um, as a part of the little exercise, the, sol the soldier who was initiating the movement would try and fool his friend and try and move erratically or you know contraposto or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was you know they, they were just they were, they were ready to for combat like they had to be combat ready at all stages in this in this environment but then they had these cameras and they're trying to work with each other and then it, to make it even more difficult they had to see each other through the viewfinder of the camera and that was that was just an experiment i wasn't sure what was going to happen to that but um i ended up synchronizing the two videos and then um people would go into a museum space and they'd be kind of caught in the crossfire of these two videos and um I don't have it here, I wish I could. Um, mm. But it's, it's, a, it's a pretty abstract work. It's just, and, and, and also, um, the thing that I was impressed uh, with these soldiers was that they, they took it on as if it was like a drill. Like they took it on very seriously. Like I tried to tell them that there, that there was no right or wrong, that, that no one's getting marked. Um, I wasn't like a secret uh, assessor. <laughs> like they were, you know, I just had to let them know that it was, it was, it was all, it was all fine. Um, but pretty soon they, they, they were, they were kind of treating it as if their life depended on it, and mm. and that was interesting for me. Um, there, there was a there was a version that you made. Um, it had a slightly different title, which I can't remember. But there was a version that you made, which was a view in the position of one of the camera. Yeah, I don't like that one as much. <clears throat> Mm. So I think I was pretty shit at it. Yeah. <laughs> I but it, I was really bad at it. The, the, the interesting thing about it, I think, is that when you look at the way you move, so just a bit of background as well with Sean's work, a lot of his work outside of this field is to do with gesture and the way that we understand gesture and what does, you know, what does gesture mean. And um, I think when you compare those two works, uh, one of the interesting things is the way in which you move as opposed to your opponent. And there's a kind of a strafing movement that happens uh, with the, the soldier that is entirely different from the way that you're, that you're actually operating as well. Yeah, yeah, it's the difference between professionals and amateurs. I'm the am there's a couple of professionals in the audience here, too, but I'm, I'm just, yeah, I was, I was interested in how um, bodies can kind of be calibrated and that, like, units can operate, like, where they, they, they're predicting each other's movements. There's a kind of a, a lot of instinct and, and it's, it's kind of beyond what happens within a dynamic like in group sport. Because mm -hmm. in group sport, you get that um, sense that there's, you know, individuals working towards a kind of common goal in this most complex um, series, of, uh, series of plays or whatever, but this was just beyond that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a ne the next, um, uh, I guess in terms of the, yeah, just the, um, the, the seriousness of it all, I guess, was, was, was profound. That was a, a big, a big uh, shock for me. Yeah, one of, one of, the, <coughs> one of the things that um, I remember you saying when we were doing the interviews back in 2010 about that work and about the, the double field work as well, was that um, you felt that in that situation, and the, the phrase you used, and it was probably just a really offhand phrase in an interview that, looking at the transcript, as I was writing, it really struck me, was this idea of impossible empathy. So you were actually saying that there was a, 
um, there was a limit to which you could actually position yourself, you know, intersubjectively with uh, with that particular person you were opposed against in that in that work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the, there's a kind of there's a kind of distance with the, te the technology is a kind of distancing um, thing, uh, device, even though the, the optics bring you closer to the actual image of the other somehow. Mm. I mean, it was just, I mean, it was just a really, um, uh, any, one, one, one kind of thing that I could focus on and then think about after. Mm. It, you know, I, I needed to kind of produce work whilst I was over there. That was a part of my um, mandate or whatever. I had to produce work um, and I wanted to do it in the field. Like I wanted to, to, to make work like the one that we're mentioning now. Mm. Whilst I was, you know, um, in, 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 in Afghanistan um, and working in the tradition of pl plein air, I guess. Yeah. Of, of, of getting away from the studio and being in, 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 the, in the, the elements. But then um, the, the works that I, I kind of keep going back to are the ones that were confusing at the time. Yeah, and that, uh, that I couldn't process, and that was one of them. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, it's almost like I, I kind of go back to those works and think about what is it to try and see someone else through technology, mm -hmm. like what is it to try and see or predict the movements of another person through the limits and of a viewfinder, even though the viewfinder is giving you um, more detail than your eye could ever give you. So that, that kind of stuff was was um, what I would kind of continually return to. Um, and even to this day, I guess, uh, I'm still making work about those kinds of issues. Mm. There was another set of works that um, I think really stands out. You made quite, quite a number of works over the few years from, from that particular time, but there's another set of works that really stands out for me, which was the behind point of view Middle East area of operations. Um, and just to describe these, these are actually a series of, I think, eight uh, portraits of um, Australian troops in Afghanistan, which are actually the backs of their heads. So, you know, if you can imagine, as you would normally take a portrait of someone looking at the camera, this was the back of their head. So you have the, the effect of essentially looking over their shoulder and seeing what they were seeing. And at the time, you talked a lot about um, the idea of uh, constantly kind of seeing, it was about looking at people looking, but also there was a, a resonance in that with the notion of the sublime as well in that landscape, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, I was really obsessed with this. Um, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a, a go-to example for romantic landscape uh, um, painting, or even the romantic tradition is this uh, Caspar David Friedrich painting uh, that he painted in 1818 called uh, Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog. I don't know if people know this one, but it's a, a guy who, who you see from behind. He's on this kind of mountain peak, and he's looking across this huge kind of mountain uh, you know, terrain and there's all this mist in the valley. It's, it's a very um, striking painting, but it's, it's an example of double looking, of, of, of the viewer looking at someone in the painting looking into, into that pictorial space. Mm -hmm. and, and I was interested in this idea of, of restaging that composition, but in this um, really majestic, enormous landscape um, that, that I just couldn't kind of it was just overwhelming, you know, mm -hmm. and, and but also it was a really stupid project because basically what I was doing was sneaking up behind people who had really powerful weapons, <laughs> <laughs> and that's not cool. You don't do that. You don't scare people who've got M4s, you know. But what I do is I I take the photo, and then and then I would ask them, I would show them the photo. I wasn't about exploiting people going up and running and taking a shot and then running off. I, I'd, I'd go up and ask them what they felt about this photo and if they thought their relatives would be able to identify them. And that was one of the things that I was interested in is um, thinking of portraiture and then thinking of the face as the privileged site of identification. Um, this is if you kind of eliminate biometrics and stuff. And, and, and but all of the uniforms and the gestures uh, uh, that, that would kind of inform people of who they were looking at without the face. And one, one um, example was pretty obvious. There was a, um, a female soldier who was um, actually in a base at that time, although um, she had just come back from the patrol, mm. and she had this beautiful blonde plaid coming out of the back of her helmet. 
And um, not that that would seem to signify um, the feminine, but it was, it was um, um, obvious to a lot of people who saw the photo that that was a female soldier. And um, as opposed to the, the guy who doesn't have a helmet on at all, and, um, and it's unclear whether that's an Afghani translator or a special forces operative. So there's, there was some, some, some portraits were deliberate in terms of not being obvious, where others were pretty clear, I thought. Um, but it's, it's not for me to say, you know. I, I just took the photos and had those references in mind, and then the rest of the work is um, out of my hands, I guess. Mm. So moving beyond this then, when you, so you came back, uh, I remember there was, it was quite a long kind of gestative period really of uh, working out, you know, what the works were going to be. And I think you had the first exhibition, which was what was the Australian Memorial, around about nine or 10 months later, and then, uh, the, then the works actually toured. Yeah. Um, what did you find, how, let me put this a different way. Uh, what was the general um, way in which the work was received? And I, I mean that not only uh, in the press and that kind of thing, but also by other artists, by the Australian art world, which, you know, yeah, I think they're small pretty, compared, compared to... Yeah, I, I think they're pretty hard impressed by it. You know? yeah. I, think, I think because it, it didn't really... I, I think it was kind of like, it was, it was what I thought it was, which was really open and um, complex for me. Not that the work was complex, but the experience was complex and, and it was confusing. I, 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 and, it was, and also I wanted those works to be um, non-conclusive or unconclusive, mm. whichever way, probably non. I, like, they were kind of like, I didn't want to make um, work um, that, well, actually even the first lot of work, Ten months wasn't enough time. Mm. It was it was kind of getting work ready for an exhibition, but I wasn't so clear about any any particular work in that show because I just needed more time to process. And then pretty soon after that, I realised I won't I wasn't going to process a lot of it anyway. It was it was just trying to get it to the point where I felt um, like it would, it would be able to you know go out there and be an okay work. And I wasn't I wasn't so sure, but the photos. And the videos I felt comfortable because doing because they were, they were my medium. You know, I was running running around with a video camera and a, and, a, and, a, and DSLR, and that and that was unusual for the commission. People people at the War Memorial were were still wanting a painting or two, mm. and I was like, come on, mm. you no know one, you've got you've got a hundred years worth of this stuff. Don't you want some more yeah. digital video? Yeah. <laughs> so I was trying to push I was trying to push the medium as well as the content of the works, in a way. Mm. Um, I felt like I was trying to um, advocate and, and um, endorse this stuff, which was also the stuff of the warfare. Like, mm. it wasn't like anyone was getting, um, you know, a kind of awareness of where Terry Taliban was or Al-Qaeda operat operatives from doing um, paint, landscape painting. Mm. They were getting it through optics and um, really high-powered, um, you know, um, just um, surveillance technology, and so it kind of made sense to use that kind of technology um, in in the field. I um, wonder. I wonder, and this is a very speculative thing that just kind of hit my brain. What you might have made of the experience had you had the access that you've had in the last five years to VR technology? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would have been able to access the technology that a lot of soldiers were already accessing. Over because I, I remember this one sto story, and Ben has this as well. Yeah. Um, uh, is that we? Well, I was talking to um, jet fighter pilots in the U.S. Air Force, and they were talking about this technology where uh, an F-35 Lightning had cameras all over the surface of the plane, and the pilot had a head-mounted display system where they were able to see what the cameras were recording on the exterior of the aircraft. So, so for an example, if you're in a cockpit. And, I, and you look down, you wouldn't see your legs. Or if you look across, you wouldn't see a foreshortened version of the wing of that aircraft. You'd see beyond the aircraft. You would you basically become a, a, a disembodied um, panoptical head, mm. traveling beyond the speed of sound. Like Wonder Woman's uh, yeah, <laughs> invisible airplane. Absolutely, Wonder Woman's <laughs> invisible airplane. 
wasn't an, an <laughs> image that came to mind, but now that you mention it, it is so close to Wonder Woman. Yeah, yeah. Boy, everybody. And it's amazing that we've got to that point. <laughs> Wonder Woman really dictated the kind of technology that we But it was, it was that, you know, hearing that, those yeah. kinds of reports of like, of augmented reality um, being built into the kind of um, operating system of an aircraft was was huge. I mean, that was, and also like you know, it was it wasn't a big thing in two thousand and nine for um, like say an Apache gun hel gunship hel helicopter pilot to have a, a weapon system that just moves everywhere they move. Mm. So you wouldn't want to sneeze, yeah, mm. if you weren't wanting to uh, release ordnance on the whatever. Because uh, I guess that's what I was also interested in was where. The technology was so good, but the body started to let the technology down. Mm. And, and I was probably looking at um, sort of vehicles, we weaponized vehicles that were that were having bodies operate them in the vehicle for the last time. Mm. Because already by the time I, I got um, over there, um, UAVs were mm. huge, and and yeah, a lot of surveillance and. Um, uh, operations were already using lo lots of VR and AR, so it was. But I didn't have access to it at that point. Mm. That wasn't. It wasn't a kind of consumable thing. Mm. What were the limitations? Do you think of? Uh, you know, we've, you, we've heard the word embedded a few times today, and you were an embedded artist essentially. Thinking back now, ten years later, what were the limitations of being in that embedded scenario? Well, I, I couldn't stick my head out of a bushmaster. Mm. You know, like I just had, I couldn't do things because it, was, it would just be too. It was just going to put. Um, it was either going to slow people down. Mm. We were already under huge amounts of pressure. Yeah. Like massive amounts of pressure, and um, I couldn't. I couldn't run some ideas by them because it was just completely inappropriate. Yeah. Um, and so that I had to limit myself, uh, just in order to um, make sure that I wasn't. I wasn't jeopardizing. Um, and also, I wouldn't be allowed. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be embarrassed for myself by uh, running some of my ideas by, um, by, by, the, by these troops who were really, um, you know, I mean, I guess, I guess it's, 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 it's probably the thing that um, goes with embedded journalism or war photojournalism is that um, there's only a certain amount of work you can make under those conditions and then, and then the rest of the work happens um, in my own time or... Mm. Uh, outside of those restrictions, um, and maybe it can be more critical for that reason after the fact. Mm. Um, but um, but during during those moments where you're embedded, I think that that I had to try and learn. I'm not sure if I did um, to work within the restrictions. Yeah, because there was a lot of photos that were vetted, and um, there was an editing process, and I'm, I'm and I'm not sure what where that material. Where it went, or if it will come back to me, but um, yeah, it, some some work uh, I, I I was I had to hand over. Mm. It wasn't because it was it wasn't because it was um, um, outrageously abject or politically sensitive. It was just um, sometimes it was just op operationally uh, they call it opsec, mm. operational security. It was just a breach of opsec. It showed too many landmarks, or um, there was you know. An image that wasn't going to help the narrative, so that got um, filed away, I guess. But it, 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 I, but but that's not that wasn't a problem for me at the time. Mm. At the time, I was just I was just trying to um, r record uh, in a way where I would be able to kind of maybe make sense of it after after the fact. Mm. If that makes sense, but it actually makes sense. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in some ways, you're, it's it's like if. Uh, from a research point of view, you're going and collecting massive amounts of raw data, some of which yeah. become a key work and some of which never see the light of day. Yeah, and, and, and all the other stuff I just keep arranging uh, for the rest of my life in, 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 in an attempt to try and make me a, a, a kind of... A, a, a not meaning out of it. I'm not yeah. trying to produce meaning, but um, maybe, it's, maybe it's more heuristic, maybe it's more like of a personal understanding but it, it's like a constant collaging and rearranging of that material. Because I was going to ask you about that. <clears throat> I remember um, a few years ago, I think it was in about 2015 maybe, you had the show in Adelaide 
um, which included other works which weren't part of the original commission but actually expanded the whole theme. And then you've continued to make uh, works that kind of deal with the same thing. Um, there was an exhibition that you had uh, that I saw at the Australian Centre for Photography that included a, a poem, in fact, that Ooh, you yeah, had. I was hoping you were going to forget that. <laughs> um, very long, very long poem um, that included. Um, it includes some letters as well, but um, it was a, a kind of poem to Chelsea Manor. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I, to me, that I see that as kind of a, an evolution when I when I saw that work, which I think was around about 2017. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Um, I saw that work myself as being a kind of an evolution um, in this yeah. narrative. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I guess I had to kind of look at the experience from like. Every every aspect I could, yeah. like I had to kind of make my position every other available position to me somehow. Like I mm. and and I, I had to I had to recognize that a, a big part of my experience was coming back um, from Afghanistan and thinking I, I saw what I was seeing and you know like I was seeing it happen in field hospitals or in the field. But but, but what I did but then as soon as I got back I. Um, WikiLeaks published uh, Collateral Murder, mm. and um, I'm not sure if people know that video. It's a video of a Reuters journalist getting, um, uh, well, shot and killed uh, at a distance from like a, a, a helicopter gunship. It was because of a misunderstanding around the form of the camera. Mm. The camera just looked like a, like a, a, you know, like an assault rifle. They thought, I think they thought the tripod was an RPG. Yeah, yeah, so it was just a misunderstanding of their forms. And, um, and, um, and you know, what ensued was horrendous. Mm. But for me to see that, um, and then pretty soon after that, the Afghan war diaries were leaked onto Wiki WikiLeaks. And then I had a friend try and help me understand what that was saying about the region that I was in. Mm. And, and so, I, I was I was observing empirically one thing, and then there was all of this data that was coming through after my experience that was informing me of what was happening in the region and what I wasn't probably getting past as a memo that there was like you know collateral mm. you know going on, and that that's probably something you um, that wasn't useful to show the artist in the region at the time, mm. whether it was me or Ben or whatever. Um, but I, I just I took an interest in in that aspect of the war, the information, mm. all the all the data information, so, and so uh, that became a huge part of my thinking mm. of 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 these individuals that changed the course of the war, and that can happen officially. You know, this is what um, mm. people who are awarded um, you know medals of of valor for if, if their actions within the battle changes the nature of the battle. Yeah. Like, so so um, that, that's of interest to me. Like say someone like Mark Donaldson, who, who is in um, our special forces, um, he found himself once running after an Afghan translator. So this, the, the translator had been shot and fell out of the back of a, a patrol vehicle. And then it was like 50 meters until Mark was like, hey, is anyone gonna get this guy? because uh, he was bleeding out and they were getting ambushed uh, and and so he took it upon himself to jump out of the back of this bushmaster run up grab this guy put him over his shoulder and run back as he's just getting strafed by bu bullets and, and, and all even his 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 colleagues just thought that was insane um but because he he um did that and a few other actions and, and really changed the nature of what was and what it, you know they, they weren't prepared to leave anyone behind even though they were really on the back foot um, and he was awarded a Victoria Cross um, for that that action and and that was interesting for me to, to hear about those stories but I was also interested in in the leaks and the information that was um, that was disrupting the narrative um, from the margins or from some sort of digital liminal space yeah and so I wanted to kind of consider it all I wanted to consider what was happening with Chelsea and Julian Assange, as well as Mark Robinson. And, and, um, and, and there was a big range of information and, it, and, and it's still taking a while to kind of 
process, I guess. But those individual works, um, I, I put out there, and yeah, it was, it was a poem. I had to, I had to write uh, Assange and uh, Manning a poem, even though I'm a really bad poet. A shocking poet. Just had to do it. Mm. Um, I want to talk uh, a bit about the work which is here in this exhibition, um, which is AR15. It's AR15, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 2016, yeah. Yep. Um, you don't know what, what, what I didn't actually. I don't know. I was like the catalog resonating, so I'm going to flick into it. Um, it's an interesting. It's an interesting and appropriate work to have here in so many respects, not just because you're here and also Max is here, who's actually in the video. Um, and it's filmed in Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting that it's in this show, I think, because um, when it came out, so you actually produced, I think, for the purposes of the Traces of War exhibition, which was at King's, <coughs> King's College in London. And it's not a work that, unlike, so video works such as Double Field, for instance, it's not a work that is so completely obviously a, a work about war. Mm -hmm. So tell me a bit about how, particularly this work, which has been included in more exhibitions as well, and in this particular exhibition, you know, that we're in at the moment. Um, tell me how you, you, for you, how that work figures in terms of the, the overarching theme of war. All right, I, I guess um, this is my personal take on it because um, I, I can't really, I can't really control the work. You know, I, 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 but I, my propaganda on this work is that I, I met Max, and I knew that um, that Max had an extensive like experience like over multiple multiple like deployments. So already I, I, I knew that um, that this. Guy, so, sorry man, I'm talking about you objectively, sorry man. That, that this man, this handsome man, um, was able to um, manipulate this weapon, like this tool, um, as if it was like, you know, like, like a prosthetic, like a part of, of his body, and like, like I had seen other, other, other soldiers um, with their weapons, and I, I just find that astounding because I'm, I'm interested in that kind of um, efficacy, that kind of um, technical understanding of, of technology um, in any field, mm. and this is this is where I'm, I'm interested in, like, say, a soldier um, and a dancer and an athlete um, being and an artist being um, similar in a sense, because there's a kind of complete commitment to the the tools and the expression, um, and, and and in in the case of a soldier's work. Um, the service also is um, uh, it, it's within the mandate, the charter or whatever, is that there could be a huge sacrifice. And in fact, even just um, the concept of the sacrifice is in itself such a huge commitment that um, I, I probably have to put the soldier in a different category to the artist and the dancer. But, um, for that but, reason, but, but anyway. I'm, I'm thinking in this work though, the, um, the, there's a kind of a not only a complexity, but a massive amount of ambiguity, isn't there? Mm -hmm. At a kind of a, a semiotic, iconological, and you know, affective level, I think. Well, I'm, I'm, I wasn't sure how how to go about trying to have like one image where the appearance, or like I guess the, I, we could get to, like the punctum is one thing, but the studium, the secondary reading, is completely different. And I, I was I wasn't sure how to go about that, but I thought maybe. And try, but but the reason why I wanted to do that was because that was happening in war all the time. Mm. Like I remember one example of this idea of my primary reading being completely different to the secondary or the more informed reading was that I, I, I like I like um, technology, but I also like vehicles, and I'm interested in aviation. Just as a uh, like a disclaimer or a, a confession or something, mm. I really like planes. Like I'm quite mad on just. I just I think there's, a, there's a, the ingenuity of this stuff, this military grade hardware is what we will benefit from um, later down the line when it's kind of received um, specifically or whatever. Anyway, so I I I, I, I was interested in in um, taking a flight on this. Um, uh, uh, it was a, actually a Chinook, like a double bladed helicopter, 
and I saw it on the on the apron, and behind it was a a, a, a helicopter gunship, and I was like really excited about getting onto this this. Uh, and I, it, other other people have had this experience. This is not a new experience. I, I, I'm I'm really glad I wasn't the only one who made this mistake. But I, I wanted to get on the on to the the chopper, and I got the movements orders and all that sort. Of, and then, and just as I was about to get on the chopper, the guy goes, "You do know this is a carrot, yeah?" And I was like, "What, man?" And he goes, "Well, we're just going to go up to Hellman pro Province, but we're going to. Well, this is the carrot." And I was like, "Dude, I don't know what you're talking about. But I'm getting on this schnook, man. I love schnooks." And um, and he goes, "No, we're, we're going to go really low and slow, and then then we've got all the thermal imagery going on behind the chopper in the helicopter gunship behind, and we're just going to find where all the." hot muzzles kind of light up trying to shoot this chopper and i said wow i'm not going to get, get on that chopper then <laughs> <laughs> so 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 you know like i because I, I, I was completely unaware of what was going on yeah. and they just thought i was super like really great to get on this car because they're like someone else is getting on this hot <laughs> ride with us man and so and um that was you know like i felt like i wanted to make work that was that that kind of, like, you know, I don't know if I, if I was able to do that or not, but I was trying to make those kinds of works where it was almost like the image was one thing, but then the content was a, a completely different, um, uh, you know, circumstance or whatever. Um, because that just happened all the time. To, to, like, I just, I just saw this kind of double, triple play of meaning or, you know, um, even, um, just the fact that we were drinking beer, but it wasn't getting anyone drunk. We were just having a conversation about near beer before, because you know um, we'd have to respect like local, like Muslim practice, yeah. And so um, military installations were were, were alcohol free, um, but now I'm only just finding out now how um, soldiers were creatively um, soup up their near beer. Right. Very creative. <laughs> You know that kind of stuff was was those kinds of narratives were that's that's of interest to, to me because it's kind of there's a lot of creative work that takes place within military culture, mm. uh, including um, like graphic culture. Like I was really interested in 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 sign systems and graphics, and and also gestures. Like my, my my father had this thing that I didn't even know was a military thing. When, when we were in trouble, or we had to get back to my father really quickly, for whatever reason, mm. he'd just pat his head like that. Mm. And I didn't know that there was like an Australian um, like combat code for, come here. Like, you know what I mean? Like, and it's really clear, because you can't mistake the gesture. Mm. And I didn't know that until much later in life. And, um, and also, I, I, I was getting military acronyms as a, as a kid that I didn't realise. You know, like, let's RV somewhere. You know, RV, what, you know, and, and so and LZ, all these, all these kind of letters started to kind of unzip into, into, into kind of more meaning um, whilst I was over there somehow, and and so that, that was that was kind of interesting, you know, trying to work out where I was with these acronyms, mm. having known them and never seeing them used in a professional context. So I, I think that some of the best work in in war has happened through. Um, photojournalists, you know, because, and I and I'm not that good. I just wanted to make it like I'm. I'm okay as a photographer, but um, you know, there's been there's been cases of like war photojournalists who have been as active and and involved as any of the belligerents within that um, within that um, battle or exchange or whatever it was, and you know, and they have received PTSD. Um, accordingly, you know, and so I, I, it's not like as an artist I would say, oh no, I'm beyond the, you know, the kind of photojournalism um, of, of that. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that, I'm saying I, I'm probably, I'm not able to claim that because that's, photojournalism means you, you have to, you have to be very involved and also try and work out what's happening photographically, that's a pretty tough thing to do when you're in the middle of chaos. I, I, I think my photos were more about trying to work out what, what, what the hell is this thing called? What's the camera doing? Do you know what I mean? What, 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 how can the camera be confused as a weapon or how does the camera not work? You know, I was probably more interested in 
seeing seeing the problems of the camera rather than using it to its f um, full functionality, like some of my favorite photojournalists do. So yeah, I can't claim that I took any photos. That Were you being back then? Do you change politically as a result of your experience? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess it's interesting because it, 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 I knew that I was involved in a war that was very different to my, my father's um, experience in Vietnam, but then I can also see the similarities, I guess. So I guess it reinforced some um, um, political sort of positions that I had and then completely dislodged other ones. So I, I don't know if I'm being too indirect about this, but maybe, maybe it was... Um, you know what was really tough was like knowing that um, that as a kid I really loved. I, I mean, I've got this. I use this all the time. This yeah. is just, but 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 going over there and seeing the hardware and the amount of um, just the energy that goes into war. Um, I always thought that well, I was a part of the Rebel Alliance, but it was more like the Empire. And but then but then I always knew that the Empire had better equipment. I was completely. I, I, I just know that, a, like a Tie Fighter, can give an X-wing a serious run for its money. Like that's just what we understand in Star Wars, right? Like Tie Fighters are hot, and so um, I, I'm interested in that idea that if I was to look aesthetically at, like, say, um, Al Qaeda or, 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 or Taliban operatives, um, they looked they looked like the rebels. They looked like the ones that had nothing and were trying to do everything with it. But then, confusingly, special forces look a lot like um, uh, the rebel lines. So, do you, do you think you were kind of drawn into the thrall of the technology um, completely? You know, how do you think that affected? I think I think it was it was good to see the to see the technology, but then it was also um, devastating. Mm. You know, like I think that um, like politically, it's like. Um, a really tough thing to reconcile because um, you know people people's lives are either being lost or ruined, and that's really tough. You know, like there's a, there's a scale, yeah. Like the scale is that the like professional belligerents uh, sign sign up for major damage, but that that can't be ever extended to civilians. Civilians and um, uh, young civilians should never ever be a part of the picture, and yet they are, and they have been for time, um, for, you know, for, for such a huge um, part of that story of warfare through, throughout civilization. So uh, it's not like I was going to be able to change anything. I don't think I was even able to observe anything to, um, with the skills of a photojournalist. All, all I had was a bit of time and, and, a, and a bit of and a little bit of access, uh, and then. From that, I'm going to have to try and uh, work out politically where I am and constantly update it. It'll have, it'll have to be constantly updated because I, I, I came away thinking, um, "Wow, I'm 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 electrified by the technology and confused about its application." Or, or another example would be, I'm rolling through a landscape and I'm seeing like an irrigation system that's like 3,000 years old, and then a plane flies over and. But I don't. I wasn't sure if the pilot could even see their body or the plane. That kind of stuff. It was just a, really quite a. It was too various and complex to try and even boil down to what's my politics before and after. Mm. Too too difficult to to try and articulate it, it, through the work. Maybe I, I have a chance. We've probably got time for one more question. Yeah. Yes. Um, as I. Uh, as you were in the military, were you ever impressed with um, the gallows sense of humor? Or uh, kind of joking? Or kind of uh, humor that you don't see here? Can you give an example of that? Yeah, I think, I think um, yeah, what you're talking about is, is, is kind of amazing because um, the, idea of, the idea of like making light of something that's like really grave um, it is kind of so I didn't really understand that. Like it's like those patches that I was really interested in, the shit magnet patches. Mm. Like um, there was this great morale patch that people would wear, like who thought they were having 
a bit of a rough time over there, and it was just this great patch of just steaming shit with this magnet, and it was just great. It was just like, I've had a really tough run this deployment or last week or whatever, I'm just a shit magnet, and that was great. But also, just the jokes, like, I mean, I think that side of it is the humanizing side. It's the human aspect of it, and that and that's, that's very important to me, to think that there's all of that stuff going on. I know, I know that the military's had problems around um, hazing, I think it's called hazing. Mm -hmm. um, I was about to say something else. <laughs> Bit rude, but, and, but 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 even hazing for me is 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 interesting. You know, I mean, the idea of being blindfolded and then stuck in a chopper, and then you don't know what the altitude of that chopper is, but then someone's getting chopped out, and then they're screaming for their life in one second, and then they're laughing the next instant. Like that's a huge roller coaster for a human to experience. Um, and and not that I endorse hazing, but that's a very interesting thing to be screaming for your life and then laughing the next moment. Wild. I mean, when does that ever happen at the shops? Do you know what I mean? It's a, just a really extreme... And, but also, I think, um, humour isn't really... Maybe we, we understand humour, like, in the, like, through MASH or, you know, TV drama, but the humour over there, all the jokes, are so much better. They're just better than... That's, that's the thing you remember. But, yeah, yeah. And no one ever would ever think of that in a war zone, right? They'd never think that they'd just get the best cracking jokes. But it's bizarre that that, that, that it's almost like a pressure release, I guess. I, that's how I understood it. Great. Oh, sorry, we're going to... No, I was going to thank Matt, Matt for the question because I wouldn't have... Yeah, thanks for the, the oh. conversation. Yeah, well, thank, thank you, Sean, for flying all the way from Melbourne yesterday, flying back tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Bit jelly. Big trip. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much because it's, it's been a real pleasure having you and catching up on this after 10 years after your initial deployment as an official war artist. Um, so if you enjoy me.